My name is Laura June Albert. I'm in shared leadership of Indian Summer Arts Society with Pavan Diol. And this is our first year in leadership of the organization. We've been going through a leadership transition this year. And so I have a few thank yous. This does not happen without support. And the first people that I want to thank are our incredible team of staff, our board of directors, and all of the volunteers. <laughs> Yeah, they've, everybody has worked so hard and in so much faith to protect and steward this incredible organization into a bright future. And so we are a bold team with bold programming and we have a bold ask. We have a goal of raising $70,000 before July 20th. And so we're asking if you have it in your capacity to give, to consider joining us for as little as $25 to support this festival, paying our artists fairly, being accessible to as wide an audience as possible and to have a bright and long future ahead of us. <laughs> it's, it's honestly a vulnerable thing to ask for support and so thank you for that encouragement and that applause. That's, that's really nice and meaningful, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have the support of several organizations who've helped us get to this moment with this event in particular. I want to thank our founding cultural partner, Simon Fraser University, as well as our major partners, UBC and Langara. We also have an event presenting partner tonight, which is SFU Libraries. We love our libraries. We all need to use our libraries. <laughs> Go to your library's events, support your libraries. We need to protect those institutions. And also to our incredible festival series partner, partner, festival series partner, Hari Sharma Foundation. Some of those folks are in the audience tonight. We really appreciate the Hari Sharma Foundation. There are multiple ways that you can support this organization by coming to events, by spreading the word, by donating if it's within your means. Each should give according to their means and should receive according to their means. And so we appreciate you for being here and for supporting in whatever ways you can. Thank you. And now to tonight's show, Not What You Expected, featuring three powerhouse South Asian women. I'm so excited to introduce tonight's facilitator. She is one of our curators this year. She is fierce, she is a force, she makes us laugh. <laughs> Anushka Ratanaraja, an interdisciplinary artist and arts organizer. She has worked as a producer, performer, writer, facilitator, and organizer with cultural and arts organizations in Vancouver, Montreal, and New York. Anushka is invested in collaborating and creating work with women artists of color, queer and femme artists, and trans artists. Please welcome Anushka Ratanaraja to the stage. Um, we're going to be here talking about uh, accountable, responsible, compassionate, and decolonial leadership. And I really feel so incredibly privileged and lucky to be working alongside Pavan and Laura June. Uh, we were just having a jam sesh upstairs, having all our feelings, and I think that the horizontal shared model that you two have championed and embraced is something that's really special and I think more arts organizations should do it. Um, and I'm just really grateful and I think that that's why this conversation felt safe and welcome to have in this space because as a curator I have your backup and that's really important. So another round of applause for those two. Love you. Uh, so, hi, my name is Anushka. Uh, I am so excited to be here to have a conversation with two of the smartest, most badass, fierce women that I know in the world. Um, selfishly, this event is just for me. 
and you're lucky to be here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is going to be um, not your usual panel, not your usual kind of Q&A talky kind of vibe. We're going to be organically following each other and um, sharing stories with each other. Um, we're in my living room. These are all of my own chairs. So um, yes, thank you. I do have very good interior decor style. Um, but we're going to get started now. That's the end of my banter. And I would like to welcome two women to the stage. You know them. You love them. Do you know them? Do you love them? Let's first welcome Anjali Apadurai to the stage. How you doing, Ange? Good, how's it going? Good, yeah? yeah? Happy to be here? Yeah, excited to talk with Harsha. Yeah. Let's bring her out. Harsha Walia. <laughs> How you doing, Harsha? I'm doing great. Great. I'm such a fan of Anjali. Yeah. It's not even funny. Yeah. I know, yeah. right? Yeah, we get to do this. <laughs> I know. The two of you together. <laughs> not the same person at all? Nope. We're not <laughs> doppelgangers <laughs> at all. No one has ever mixed us up on Twitter, in real life, at various events, and in general public. No, absolutely not. Yeah, I've never never been called Harsha. No. Have you ever been called Anjali? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, so let's get started. As you can see, the tone will be a bit irre irreverent. <laughs> We're obviously also hilarious. Yes. So feel free I'm so confused to who I am right now. <laughs> I know. I'm like, wait, which one of you is? <laughs> am I me? What's happening? Um, well, thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited that we get to talk to each other and talk about what it's like being us in leadership positions and taking up space and redistributing power and decolonizing our own selves and the places and ways that we work in the world. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together and thank you to the Summer Festival. Thanks for Seriously, being here. It's so wonderful to see that leadership, that mm -hmm. dynamic duo. Um, we were just talking backstage. It's just, it, it, mm -hmm. the vibe is new and fresh and interesting, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So when I first reached out to you both, it was sort of, I don't know if it felt like a random ask or how you felt about the ask, but you both were like so generous. Um, I know it felt vulnerable for me to ask, and some of the conversation we'll have today is probably going to feel vulnerable for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you were just saying backstage what this conversation is going to mean to you and how it's going to feel. Um, we're learning in public, so you know we expect everyone to be gracious and compassionate with us as we are with you. So yeah, how did it feel to be asked to be here? <laughs> You go first. <laughs> um, how did it? Uh, how did it feel? Well, I mean, it's Anushka. Who says no to Anushka? Yeah, first of actually. all, actually, like, right? Um, but no, truly, it was an an honor to be thought of, to be in conversation with both of you, two people who I admire so much um, and have walked alongside in many capacities for so long. Um, I was and am nervous because I am a vault when it comes to talking <laughs> um, about feelings, uh, talking about stories. I really wish I could be sitting here talking about why borders are fucked, but that's not what I get to do. So <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous and I was nervous when you asked, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to be in conversation. Yeah, that part for me as well. I was also... Uh, nervous for a whole other reason because like I'm on the stage with Harsha Walia who I have looked up to as I've come up as an organizer and as a 
person who wears various hats for a long time, but also um, it just felt, yeah, also physically can't say no to Anushka, <laughs> so charming. And just the chance to have this conversation, the three of us, yeah. Since you can't say no to me, <laughs> please donate to our festival campaign. <laughs> Um, well, that feels really nice to hear because I respect both of you a lot and I would not say no to you either. So here we are, Mutual Admiration Society. Be careful Society. what you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about leadership and what our experiences with leadership, what it means to us to be in positions of leadership, what it feels like to lead from the front, from the back, to lead in a community, to be a part of a team versus being isolated. Um, all three of us have experience being inside institutions and also outside institutions pushing back. Um, so, Let's talk about it. <laughs> what are some of the skills that you've brought from grassroots organizing into institutional spaces that have been transformative for you? What has sustained you when working in those colonial institutions from your communities that feed you? Um, yeah, you know, I was really lucky that uh, some of my, uh, most of my mentors, uh, when I was getting into uh, movement spaces and social, social movement organizing, essentially, um, they were women, most of them, like really powerful women. And there was this quality of incredibly pragmatic leadership um, as they sort of perform these incredibly um, essential roles within collectives, largely horizontal collectives. Horizontality is a huge challenge. I'm sure you can speak to that as well. It is, it is beautiful and it's challenging. And I was lucky enough to be um, mentored by women who just did it with such a level of grace and pragmatism. And so to me, leadership is, uh, was modeled in that way of just um, getting yourself out of the way but, um, and doing what needs to be done, but still being looked up to by people and being able to sort of skillfully lead while not centering yourself. And there's a real skill to that, and um, I was very lucky to witness a lot of women in my life modeling that. Thanks for that, and I appreciate the, um, yeah, the thoughtfulness around the ways in which feminist leadership in itself often looks completely different, right? It yeah. means something else. Um, I'd say for me, in terms of being in institutional spaces and the experiences that I brought or tried to bring that come from grassroots experience are similar. Really the emphasis on collectivity um, and really thoughtful about where your accountability lies because that can change really quickly, right? When you're in any kind of large institution that is in some way more deeply complicit in the system, it becomes very easy to think that you're accountable to funders, you're accountable to like a small board of directors, you're accountable to the state systems, you know, all of the, all of the kind of structures that prop you up um, and also are intended to placate you. And so for me, the challenge, but really what came from grassroots organizing and continues to come from that experience is being grounded. And I think that is often a challenge because if we don't have that sense of being centered in something other than that institution, you get lost really quickly. You get lost as to where your ethical compass is. You get lost as to who your priorities and what your priorities should be. Um, the kinds of negotiations you start to enter into start to get blurry. Like, it's just a domino effect. And so, uh, for me, continuously remaining accountable, and that has to look specific, right? We have to be accountable to specific people, to specific movements, and to specific communities. It's not like a, a vague, abstract notion. Um, that really, for me, was the main thing, was 
while I'm here, who is this work in service to? Um, who is it supporting? Whose struggles is it in alliance with and in solidarity with and advancing in ways that are consensual? Um, and also, how are the folks who are working in this space who are part of this deeply non-horizontal kind of institutional structure, feeling supported, are part of decision making, and we're trying to dismantle these hierarchies as much as possible to make them accountable, um, you know, to make sure we're respecting people's labor rights, for example, in these spaces. Um, so all of that together um, was, for me, the piece that I tried to keep at the fore of my mind throughout. Yeah, that was, yes, thank you for that. And I think that um, the part, I really resonate when you talk about being specific about who you're accountable to. I actually think that that piece, knowing who am I serving, uh, inside this institution, outside this institution, who am I serving, and being and 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 being uh, sort of very firm in that and very grounded in that, that's the part that leads to this. You know, the title of this talk, not what you expect. That's the part that makes it not fit, um, and that's the part that makes it uncomfortable. And I actually feel like that's kind of the crux of maybe this conversation is, is what is it about that accountability that, um, that causes us to grind against the gears of a colonial system? Yeah, I mean, it's because the system and the institution doesn't actually want to be accountable. I, I've found, you know, it's extremely difficult to try and decolonize from the inside especially in hierarchies that include money and pay and this sort of idea of what a person is worth. Um, and I mean, for me, being somebody's boss weighed so heavily upon me, like in my soul, because I know that like that's, I'm in charge of someone's paycheck. Like I'm holding their rent in my hands. I'm holding their groceries in my hands. Like, you know, like that's a heavy responsibility. Like if you are someone that pays people, that that's a huge, huge responsibility. And we tend to dehumanize each other in workplaces, even in workplaces like in the arts where we're very fond of saying, Bring your whole self to work. You can be your full self here. We're a family. Oh, okay. You're going to pay for my therapy bills? <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, there's that idea also of the work taking precedence over the human beings inside of the organization. And... Um, pushing back against that is incredibly difficult because we are a productivity motivated society. And there are so many times where it feels like I can't do my job because of all of the other things, you know? I luckily am not in that position, um, but I can fully appreciate like that it's, that's gotta be an incredibly difficult thing to do while balancing all these other parts of a truly feminist leadership. In terms of being a South Asian woman, whatever that means, I think we're going to break this down here tonight, um, and being mistaken for each other, which <laughs> makes no sense, but it still happens. Um, what are, what are, so as a South Asian person, as a mixed race person, someone who is a settler and who wants to be in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of these lands that we are occupying on, uh, like we're still, you know, you wanted to, we can talk about, like, I don't want any nation states either. Like, we could, we can say that. Like, I don't know what else is gonna happen. Like, I won't be alive to see it probably. But like, ideally, in my future world, there's no nation states. So we can just say that out loud if we want to. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, in terms of, what you are called to represent, what are some of the ways that you haven't been what people expected? 
being South Asian and a woman and what are the things that have been projected onto you and what are the solidarities that maybe failed you within our, like, our own communities, which are really complex and often fraught. Okay. Oh, Chill vibe. <laughs> Super easy. Woo. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I, th I th appreciate the question in terms of um, thinking through what being a South Asian femme means and also the ways in which solidarity has failed. Um, I mean, I think maybe for me to start the kind of, um, the idea of being South Asian is certainly externally imposed, right? Like the ways in which when you, I didn't grow up here, so South Asian was not something that I ever grew up identifying with. It's far too broad. It's something that certainly is, you know, a kind of census checkbox in the kind of multicultural context that we live in, um, where, you know, race and ethnicity and, and geography get conflated in really problematic ways. I think there's also um, something that doesn't speak to me personally in the ways in which we've attempted to reclaim South Asianness because of the vast homogenization um, that happens in that. And I think that's always an issue. I think currently we're in a context where that's deeply an issue when it comes to Hindutva, when it comes to the occupation of Kashmir, when it comes to caste, uh, when it comes to the geopolitics of the region, to assume that people have something in common with someone who is literally their oppressor is, um, it's just so problematic in what that means and the assumptions that that imposes on us as so-called South Asians, right? That we can somehow share solidarities with people with whom we may have very little in common with. Um, and which is why we hear, um, you know, the fact that many Kashmiris will have, will, you know, very overtly say that they have much more in common with Palestinians than other South Asians or certainly Indians, right? And so those are contexts that we have to contend with. Um, particularly in the context of culture <laughs> and what South Asianness means and what it collapses and the power dynamics that it collapses. Um, so for me, South Asian doesn't mean much without attention to those specificities. Um, and in terms of the solidarities, and that to me that's part of the failures of solidarities, right, is when it's an assumed experience um, that isn't attentive to vast power differentials as well as for me specifically the ways in which solidarities have failed have actually been, so a lot of my organizing for a really long time was in communities um, that I was in, like communities like the downtown east side or refugee communities and migrant communities. And the ways in which solidarity for me failed in the context of the broader South Asian community was a constant assumption that because I was doing that kind of organizing, I wasn't an authentic South Asian community organizer. Because someone who's in solidarity with indigenous peoples that predated the kind of Idle No More movement, who's in solidarity with sex workers in the downtown east side, um, you know, who was speaking about misogyny on the radio stations, who was speaking out about transphobia, all of that somehow meant that I wasn't a real Punjabi woman. Um, and so for me, that is also one of the ways in which solidarity failed when I failed to perform what, a, what being a South Asian femme who was politically active is supposed to do. Um, the kinds of prescriptions of culture and representation that I did not uphold. Um, and the ways in which for me, solidarity necessarily meant and continues to mean aligning with people based on my political principles as an anti-capitalist, as someone who's in solidarity with land back struggles, as someone who wants the annihilation of caste, and as someone who wants the liberation of all people in the planet. That is where my solidarity lies, first and foremost and always. Um, and so, for me, being South Asian is only in that context and is completely defined through that context, as I understand it, through Sikhi as well. Um, so for me, there's always been um, that lack of um, 
discomfort with what South Asian means and what it's supposed to mean in dominant spaces and multicultural spaces and left spaces and in South Asian community spaces as well. Yeah, and that, that homogenization actually becomes a tool of oppression when we are suddenly interchangeable and, and therefore your specific set of solidarities is erased in service of a colonial or an oppressive project. It's like we can just bring someone in who has that very basic surface level set of characteristics that is, um, that is just sort of devoid of like the actual um, almost entirety of your identity as a person. You know, I walk into spaces and I am seen as a South Asian woman, and I'm and there's so, there are a bunch of assumptions that come with that that are, you know, somewhat place specific. So here, um, there's a large Punjabi population. I'm not Punjabi. I'm Tamil, so that's already like one layer of it. And then as soon as we start um, talking about who we're actually in solidarity with, who we want to organize with. Um, and start to align with people who are, you know, not the people we're supposed to align with. It just, it sort of, uh, it becomes a point of contention. It becomes friction. Yeah. Yeah. I think as someone who's mixed race, my sweet parents in the front row, Woo! angels, um, and as somebody who grew up in like a very white environment, um, I had no real understanding or language to um, articulate the like traumas and complications and, and joys of that experience until I was much older and I was going to university and I had access to like people like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and Arundhati. Uh, you know, like I didn't have a lot of role models as a young person. I mean, I had strong women in my life. I certainly had a very strong mom, um, but I didn't have anyone who looked like me. And so the, and I also couldn't really explain myself to other people. Like I couldn't explain myself to myself. So it's been a real journey of like trying to come to understand my identity and to know that like my context is this, it's here. I have a Western context. I was raised here, like that's who I am. Yes, I'm connected ancestrally and through, you know, my relationship with my father and that side of the family to like specific, you know, places, but even when I'm in Sri Lanka, you know, in the village where my grandparents both were born, you know, it's still an alienating experience. I'm so lucky to be there, I'm so privileged to be there, but I also know nothing, don't speak the language, have no, like, my cousins and I have nothing in common. We have completely different experiences. And the gulf of trying to reach across that can feel so heartbreaking to try and connect to a more rooted self. And then to have the assumptions of, you know, whiteness or just sort of this like, homogenous idea of South Asian community sort of impose like an idea upon you and then have to have to explain that and then to feel in um, uh, inadequate in some way like even like curating this festival I'm like what do I know about South Asian art like Truly, like this is my context like I know some really amazing South Asian artists, but it's not from any kind of like you know, like really studied, like specific South Asian art, which also like there's so many like, you know, so, but I do know the context of here. I know the context of brown women and brown queer people and brown trans people here. And those are the people that I'm in solidarity with. Um, those are the people I'm invested in lifting up and and, and supporting their work. And that's who I want to engage with. It's not about like, oh, we have the same skin tone, so we're immediately BFFs. And we immediately align on the same things. We don't, we don't at all. I mean, you were just saying on the radio the other day about how we're so overrepresented in the government, and yet, like, what is yeah, it doing for us? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, there's, you know, technically South Asians are overrepresented in uh, federal, it's federal, right? Yeah, federal um, electoral politics. I feel like I have to add, you know, now that we are, have like thoroughly complicated and like skewered the idea of South Asian-ness, I do have to add that from a, a, you know, a diasporic perspective, I immigrated when I was six. So we have slightly different experiences. We all three have different, very different experiences because you were born here, right? And Harsha, you came much later when you were uh, older. I came as a child and I moved to a very white community out in Coquitlam. And the homogenization, the idea of South Asian-ness um, as a, a, a vague term, as a vague big tent, um, without knowing the history, without having had the chance, as a, as a young person, without having had the chance, or without having people around me to teach me about the specific histories of where I come from and the specific incredibly diverse um, histories of various intersecting oppressions within the place where I came from, southern India, um, it was, it was, there is an interesting um, effect of having that big tent South Asian diasporic identity. And once you're in that tent, first of all, it's, it's comforting as a young person. And then within that, there's new identity creation, right? There's a whole beautiful sort of set of mashups that happen where you start borrowing from each other's cultures and you, you find new alliances. And um, I think that's cool. However, um, the, the timeline matters, and as Harsha was mentioning, especially now, with every crisis that we are facing escalating, um, Hindutva escalating to a point where, you know, you have, a, you have a, an incredibly grave situation where India is in, you know, increasingly in a, a, um, descending into this authoritarian um, uh, place, and we, we cannot, we have to take this conversation deeper now. There's no resting in the, in the comfort of the big tent, sort of like, we are all brown people in a, in a white settler nation. It's not that anymore. We have to talk about caste. We have to talk about the oppressions within the place that we came from. And that's an internal conversation, and that is, it must be a public conversation as well. Yeah, and I think I would, thank you for that. Um, and I think I would also encourage us to think, as you were saying, Anjali, around how so many times these conversations are considered internal conversations. The idea that these, you know, the idea of not airing dirty laundry, et cetera, because you don't want to be in the gaze of white supremacy. Um, but I absolutely think we should have always pushed back against that, and we absolutely now have to push back against that, because to think that Hindutva, and caste and Islamophobia and more and more and more actually are internal issues and are not tethered to colonialism, are not tethered to white supremacy is false. These are ideologies that are built off of each other, that move together, that migrate. Um, and so there is, there is no internal conversation. Hindutva is a global phenomenon. It is operating in our schools, in our communities here. Uh, you know, the Modi government is operating here. here. Uh, Islamophobia operates in our communities here. The attacks on Sikh communities and the, you know, criminalization of Sikh dissent happens here um, and more, right? And so I think there's nothing internal about this. Um, this is absolutely part of what internationalism means and what meaningful solidarity means if we want to not just consume culture. If we don't want to be stuck in multicultural liberalism, then that means we have to engage with people's histories, people's struggles, and people's real, meaningful engagements with the world in that way. Otherwise, we are just getting stuck in culture and food conversations, so as if though that is the public and the rest is internal, which makes yeah. no sense, right? Uh, meaningful engagement for me as someone who's, you know, a South Asian means I want people to talk to me about history and politics and not just about the food that you love. Yeah. Um, right? So that's what that means. It means a meaningful conversation about what the struggle looks like for people, which is billions of people on the planet, right? This is billions of people's lives 
that's on the line. So um, I just want to echo that this isn't about it being internal. This is absolutely a public conversation because it implicates our governments. Yeah. It implicates all of us, no matter who we are and where we're located. We're part of this. Um, and so learning about it is, even if we're differently positioned, it is all of our responsibilities. Yeah, thank you for breaking down that binary. That's actually so important. It's actually also encapsulated in like the theme of this whole festival, which is you know part of this idea of us having a specific set of solidarities, which is really like a specific politic that is maybe the common denominator that makes us get mixed up for each other all the time. <laughs> um, but that you know, to me, that is it and a constant affirmation of interbeing and interdependence. It is a, it is a dogged, sort of almost fierce um, insistence on interdependence that we, that we do exist only in relation to each other, that our struggles are absolutely linked. And we cannot talk about, you know, um, like decolonization here. We cannot talk about South Asianness here. We can't have these conversations without understanding how they are intricately linked to other struggles, including struggles in so-called South Asia. I mean, that's really the core of my work. If you talk about climate justice, right, the, I, the justice part of it is recognizing that we are, there, um, it, is a, it is a power imbalance. There are um, intersecting uh, colonial forces that have created and exacerbate this problem. And what happens here, everything that happens here, every policy that's created here has an impact, a deep impact everywhere else. And um, that's one of the great failures, I think, I mean, just speaking now from the, um, from the environmental movement or from, the, from, from my area of work, is that's one of our greatest failings as, as a so-called environmental movement, is, is, the, um, is, the, is the leaving out of that, of that international solidarity piece. And that is what a colonial institution is. It is fundamentally, um, an institution that denies the existence of interdependence. It, ha it cuts off inter interdependence at certain places that are convenient for the colonial project. And so part of our work is to stay rooted in that idea of interdependence, and that's what makes it, you know, not what you expect. I feel like we just left a gap and people just clap. Uh, Thank know. you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in terms of thinking about decolonization, I know like 2017 was like that big, at least in the arts, um, you know, it was like the year of like quote unquote reconciliation, you know, when they had all that money to give to so many organizations to be like, we love indigenous people for one year. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, like, yes, we have to have a conversation about the fact that, like, we are an occupation, like, this is an occupation. It feels like regular everyday life, but it's an occupation, just like it's regular everyday life in Palestine, and it's an occupation, you know? So coming to terms with that and really, like, acknowledging that within your, like that can feel very crushing. It's a terrifying feeling to know like, oh, oh my God, I'm part of an occupying force, like without consent really, but I'm in it. So what kind of responsibilities do I have to be here? Um, but the kind of conversation about decolonization being a global effort is not really one that I see us having um, especially when we talk about Canada's colonialism, specifically through resource extraction in many places in the world, and how that colonial model that the British have developed so well, experts, five stars, joking. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like that same thing is still happening here on these lands and also elsewhere. So 
you know, even working within the idea of any kind of like Canadian institution, having to identify with the state creates this sort of barrier to you being able to like engage meaningfully with the kind of colonialism that's happening both here and elsewhere and that is like enabled by the state. Yeah, that's just what I feel and think. <laughs> Check. 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 Agreed. <laughs> um, what are some of the ways, what are some of the things that you didn't expect when you stepped into a position of leadership? Like, what are some of the things that surprised you about having to be in particular spaces? Are you asking about particular kinds of leadership? It, yeah, I mean, it could, or well, no, it could be, it could be either like the shared model that we've all experienced, or it could be from like an institutional perspective, because they both surprise you all the time, you know? So, yeah, either one. Oh, she's pulling rank. Um, okay. Um, I'm almost at auntie status. Not as much as you, but... I'm pulling auntie status. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. You know, like, the, the biggest leadership roles that I have been thrust into were in contexts that were unexpected even for me. They were not roles that I aspired to and worked for to achieve. They were, you know, in the context of electoral politics, um, running for office, suddenly you are in a position of leadership. And particularly in my last experience, that blew up into a much larger leadership role than I could have anticipated. And for me, um, it really did come down to where I was grounded because I absolutely would have lost myself if I didn't know what I stood for. And it was what you were talking about. I, I stand with uh, those that have been pushed to the margins by this colonial system, this capitalist system that devours everything in its path. And I had to be explicit with myself about that because you know, I think power, you can't really talk about leadership without talking about power. And power has a really interesting distorting effect, right? Like, the closer you get to it, the weirder people's behavior gets. And it's really interesting to see that. And then it's interesting to observe that effect in myself, too, right? Um, and we see this happen all the time. I'm sure, I'm sure folks, many folks here have an experience of, you know, and I certainly, we certainly do have an experience of being friends with someone, having a particular relationship with someone, and then they gain proximity to power. Maybe, you know, they take on a leadership role. Maybe they get elected to office. They, they suddenly have power. There's suddenly a power differential. And you watch that person change. And you thought you knew them but suddenly you don't know them anymore. And it, it's really mysterious. And I really sought to understand this as I sort of gained uh, proximity and entry into uh, the political class. And the political class was really interesting in that sense, where I'm like, we're, we're human. We have a lot in common. Maybe we're even South Asians. But, um, but there's, there's a distorting effect that happens with proximity to power. And the people who um, are the least distorted by that effect are those that are most rooted in and most explicit in their solidarities. Who are you fighting for? Who are you, who are you, um, who are you prioritizing in every decision, in every position that you take? And um, for me, you know, because of those uh, strong women mentors that I had early, when I first started climate justice work, this was, um, you know, s straight out of university or like still in university where I was uh, like working with these women who had, you know, led 
movements to take down dictators. One of my great mentors was one of the, one of the core uh, youth organizers in the Philippines to take down the dictator in the, in the 70s. 70s, right? Yeah, 70s. I should know that. And, um, and like brought that leadership experience and I, and I watched her work. And so, uh, and you know, her solidarities were incredibly explicit. And she would give up power, she would give up everything to stay rooted in those solidarities. Because it's not easy, because any, any colonial system wants to move you away from that. And power itself wants to move you away from that, actually. And so I had some of that like just burned into me <laughs> from those early experiences. And um, yeah, and then when you're able to like sort of look at it from afar and be like, whoa, this is interesting, um, power has this effect, then you can suddenly see it for what it is, which is just this weird smoke and mirror thing. Um, but that's, <laughs> unfortunately, you lose a lot of people along the way to that effect. So yeah, that was probably one of the most, one of the most interesting observations or learnings for me. Thanks for that, Anj. Um yeah, I would I would echo that, and maybe a little bit for me was like confirmation bias because, mm. you know, over the years you you do see that effect of people getting into systems of power, and you know this is a generalization, but I stand by it to some degree nonetheless. Is that it? It does change people, and for me over the years I've just been like I don't understand. <laughs> like I know you, we used to organize together, we've been in groups together, and now you are a different person. Um, you're still kind, you're still nice, but, you know, the ways in which you are willing to, um, like, excuse all kinds of violences and feel less ready to fight. And so um, getting, you know, closer to that in terms of formal kinds of leadership, which for me was always strategic. It was never, like, a career thing. <laughs> I, thought of, I knew that I never have and never will last in those roles. Um, but seeing that in such real time is, there's no other way to describe it other than it just completely fucks with your sense of reality. Mm -hmm. Because you're in real time watching people that are your colleagues, your comrades, your coworkers, whatever, um, really just completely change, <laughs> right? Like people who you think you're in the struggle with completely whether it's succumb to fear, uh, you know, whether it's like a slight shift to the right, to the center, whatever it is, um, that sense of um, how people change is really, it distorts your sense of self too, right? Um, and I think for me, the part that was really challenging was that I think we all, and for me, you ha we have the sense of like, oh, when you gain more power, you will be in the system and you will then have the power to change it, right? Whatever system that is. There's this like, this myth that if you gain access to whatever said institution is, whatever the role is that moves you closer to this hierarchical top of the system, that somehow you will have more power. Mm. And I think for me the realization was that that is patently false. Yeah, and it they is. lie to you also. Yeah. They tell yeah. you, they tell you to your face that they're gonna support yeah. your work yes. and that you're here because they want to change yeah. and they want to do things and differently. And maybe they believe it. Yeah, yeah. maybe they do. I think a do. lot of times they do, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's so many different factors at play, right? Like of you course. think that you, ha yeah, and so for me, that was the reality check, right? That like, there is like there is no echelon that one reaches where one attains this amorphous sense of power. Um, you just get lost in it, you get stuck in it, you're no longer rooted where you want to be. Um, you know, whether whatever whatever institution is, it'll look different. It's the political class, it's your funders, it's your board, whatever it is, there is someone else that will control that access to power, whatever it is. And so, for me, the realization was, you know, again, a sense of confirmation bias, perhaps, but like, there is nothing there. <laughs> it's smoke and mirrors. It is truly, yeah. 
community power. It is like in the, you know, rooms like this. It is in organizing, whatever that looks like. That looks like many different things to people. It's ultimately in horizontal relationality where we build power and we build structural change, right? Those are not pockets of small change and then big change happens somewhere else. This is where big change happens. This is where consciousness is changed. This is where terrains change. This is how we speak and relate to each other change. And so for me, that was my big realization is that power is genuinely, I mean, violence. To me, there's a difference between violence and power. Violence happens in institutions. Power is what people make together when we come together. Um, and so for me, that was the difference, right? These structures that seem like they have a lot of power are just violent institutions that reproduce themselves through all kinds of ways. But the ways in which we choose to be with each other is the ways in which we genuinely make power and change things and the ways in which we want to transform them. So for me, that was the realization that there is nowhere else to go other than turn towards ourselves. Yeah, and you know, I, I keep coming back to this idea of like solidarity. Who are you in solidarity with? I think it really comes down to just sets of solidarities. I mean, this, the colonial system, I'll just you know use the current political class as an example, that also has a set of solidarities that is um, yes. perhaps not explicit, because <laughs> many times they don't dare to be, but there is a, a, there's an implicit and, um, and very strong set of solidarities there. I mean, with uh, the wealthy, with the landowning class, with, uh, the, with colonial um, uh, perpetrators of violence, with those who hold the most, um, with those who seek to accumulate, you know, and that is, if you, again, with the thing of being explicit, if you're not explicit about who you're accountable to, then that is uh, an Im implicit set of solidarities that you can float into and unfortunately start to normalize. And we've seen that happen all too often, right? So if you're, if you're not standing for justice, you are standing for violence. There isn't like this wonderful liberal in between place that it, you know is very publicly sort of advertised to us. Yeah, I mean, like now is I I'm just speaking for myself, but like it's now is not the time for moderation. Like it's absolutely urgent. Like <laughs> we gotta move. You know, like there's no more wiffle waffling. Like you're either for or you're not. You know, um, and. Yeah, that sense of urgency can be really, really scary. Um, how, and I, you know, like I've had, I've definitely had like my hopeless moments, you know, there's many a time where I'm like just ready for the asteroid, like. <laughs> take me away, but it's like, take all of us away, you know? So it's like not a good place to be in mentally or spiritually, hoping for a mass extinction event that's like fast, not the slow one we're trapped in in right now. Ugh, just kill me quickly. Um, but, you know, so I've definitely like been in that place of like, what is the point, you know, and having, you know, come up against some serious walls and challenges in my own career and my own life where I felt deeply betrayed by people that I felt that I could trust and that I was vulnerable enough to trust, you know, like how do you, like the recovery from something like that is so intense and difficult, like, I mean, and I'm like trying to crawl my way back and I'm definitely like just really being high functioning. Everyone's like, you've got such great energy. I'm like, I'm manic for the next two weeks. Like that's what's happening. <laughs> like, you know, you have to get through it. Um, and so many parts of this process were like very triggering to me because of past experiences. Not, I mean, our container has been so beautiful and lovely and I'll say that publicly. Um, <laughs> give them your money. Um, <laughs> but 
you know, like when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, your body will remember what happened to you the last time. And we have all of these unfinished stress cycles that are just inside us building up and up and up. And so, yeah, hopelessness is like a real thing. Um, and the only time I feel hope hopeful is when I'm in connection with others and not isolated. So for me, that's what gets me through. But what gives you both hope? Like, we need it. We need to believe that there's a better future to keep moving towards it. Like, if we give up, then that's it. What do you like? What feels good? <laughs> I mean, okay. Well, what Harsha just said, your how you talked about power, like real power, like the power of collective horizontality, which is nourishing in so many ways, like nourishing, and you know, let's just be concrete about it, organizing, doing, doing anything that is in the pursuit of justice and of goodness and of active um, opposition to the violence of our current system. That could look so many different ways, but every time that happens, even in small micro ways with your neighbor or your sister or however you're doing it, that is an active practice of hope. And the doing of it is what, is, is what generates hope but is, is inherently hopeful. Like, acting in any way is inherently hopeful because you are believing in the possibility of something different. And it's also almost like you, you know, that, that power that we build together acts in unexpected ways as we've seen throughout history where social movements have achieved the unthinkable, have achieved sort of quantum changes. Um, there are almost like mycelial networks of beauty and goodness that grow as we nurture them and they pop up when you least expect it. And, you know, working towards that is an act of hope and faith, really, <laughs> kind of go hand in hand, that that will happen and that is already happening, whether we feel like it or not. Um, and I, Lord knows our bodies don't really feel that most of the time in this atmosphere of chronic stress, but, you know, honoring and knowing and having faith that it is happening. And it's hard to hold on to that faith sometimes, but it is happening. Thank you. Um, let me just say, Nush, that everything that you've talked about, um, and Anjali, that I know that you've been through, um, just deserves all of our love and rage and solidarity. And I think the things that, for me, give me hope that you both have talked about is this, right? Like, knowing that we're not alone, um, that these systems are wretched and are meant to break us, are meant to break us, and that we refuse to some degree being broken, not because we're individuals who are resilient, but because we're in ecosystems of resistance and care. And that people matter. <laughs> Our people matter to us. Um, and for me, that is hope, right? Like, it's not this utopic world that will come to be in the future. It is the present that we are making. And this may be weird and dystopian, but for me, the fact that we live in so much violence means that it's actually not that hard to make it a little bit better. <laughs> I'm kind of weird like that, but I'm like, the bar is low. The bar is, so, the is, bar is, the low. The the bar is not so trip. <laughs> low that we can fight to win something. <laughs> and every day, every day, we are winning something. We are losing a lot, but we are winning some things that are important. Um, and we cannot, we have to celebrate every victory. We celebrate every time 
that we feel that we are able to be present and you know produce not in the capitalist productivity way but create and be with community um, and show up and organize and I absolutely believe that the antithesis to capitalism and colonialism is our connection because the system is intended to commodify us it is also intended to make us compete it is intended to make us feel alone. And every time we are connected, we refuse all of those things, right? We refuse to be in competition. We refuse to be simply products of our labor. And we refuse to be alone. Um, and for me, I have a lot of hope in that. I mean, I've, like so many of you, I see so many elders here who have been struggling for decades and who I have the honor of learning from. I see you. Um, and you know that struggle is literally being able to get up and fight, not in some pursuit of like hopeless romanticism, but because in the present, every single day we are making something different. Mm -hmm. And every time that we organize, we create the terrain for something else to be possible. And as you said, Anjali, you never know when that's gonna shift and become a groundswell for something that we never imagined. And we hear that all the time, right? When people ask these moments that are revolutionary, like, what did you do? And they're like, it wasn't one thing. This was yeah. decades and decades of building in many different ways, in many different ways. And so to be able to contribute to it in any way, in any small or big way, and in any way, I think is for me what gives me hope. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say is not doing anything for me is what, makes me completely demobilized. Like when I am doom scrolling is when I feel completely demobilized. Um, and so for me, doing is an act of hope because it's the only way to feel like I have any sense of agency, to not feel like a complete victim to these systems of violence, but to believe that there is something that I can contribute as part of a we, because there is no I. Part of something that I can do that is part of a bigger we that may change the spinning bullshit towards something else. So for me, that's the sense of hope is because without it, there's, you know, if we don't fight, we will lose. If we fight, we have a chance at winning. And so for me, the gamble is at the chance of winning, even if it goes way beyond my lifetime, which it certainly will. There's nothing to say after that. Okay. <laughs> well, now some lucky people get to ask some questions, if you can bear to do so after. What a beautiful monologue. <laughs> you can also um, heckle. Yeah. <laughs> I love a, a good troll. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we want to invite folks up to the microphone that's like right up here on the stage? Yeah, and or we can pass one around. Does anyone have a question? We've got one question over there. LJ, do you wanna, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I lost track of who it was. Yellow shirt. Can I pass it? Hi. Thank you for that. Um, I guess the question that popped up for me was, I think the calls for necessary and radical change are often met by in the mainstream media or the mainstream discourse by like rhetoric of, but we need to be incremental and we need to be pragmatic, right? Um, and pragmatic or incremental is like non-radical, non-active, like non right? So. Um, I'm just curious about, well, how do you feel about that? And also, like, how do you retort back when you hear that? Thank you for that question. Um, 
In terms of, yeah, particularly if it's coming from mainstream media, as, as you were saying, um, for me, the answer is typically like, you know, incrementalism still maintains a deathscape for people. And if that's what incrementalism is, it's just, it's not justice. And so for me, it is not just about it being radical, but if we truly believe in liberation for all people, then a radical transformation is the only thing that will get us there. And so to me, that is actually pragmatism, because otherwise you're saying you're actually willing for some people to die a slow death, a premature death, to be cast away, to be extracted and exploited. Um, so to me, that is actually completely not practical because you're willing to engage and trade injustice and injustice in this kind of way. So um, I actually think, you know, radical transformation is just. It's the only practical reality to ensure that we have a planet that is inhabitable um, for all people in ways that is equitable and just and truly decolonial and more. Um, so for me, that's typically my response. Um, yeah, and incrementalism, when it's used in that kind of way to weaponize against radical transformation, is it's not just curiosity, right? It's actually trying to say um, that you actually have nothing useful to offer to the struggle for justice. Um, and I think we have to be thoughtful about the fact that the ideas of incrementalism really are liberalism. Like, they're typically used by the elite to squash social movements. They're used by big agencies to squash radical social movements. Like, it's not just at the level of discourse. They play a very particular co-opting role to minimize social movements from gaining power, right? It's like actually a bludgeon. Um, so I think we also have to be thoughtful about who's asking that question and to respond to it, but also sometimes to not take it too seriously. Because if we internalize it and think like, oh, maybe what I'm saying is not accurate. Maybe I need to mediate what I'm saying. Um, then I think that's actually time to be like, no, I'm going to, I absolutely stand by this. And this is why. And the last thing I'll say is like, if, you know, I invite everyone to take like one moment to think about any you know, any moment in history that has inspired you. It's not going to be a movement that called for incremental change. <laughs> you know, like even what we learn in school is not movements that called for incrementalism. Like the things that we learn about in history are movements for abolition, movements for anti-colonial struggle, movements for queer liberation, like people calling for radical transformation. So, you know, that's also something to remember is no incremental change is actually what inspires any of us, regardless of where we are on that kind of political spectrum, right? And so if we think about what inspires us, then I think that also calls on us to try to act accordingly. And it makes us uh, forget that history. It, it erases that history, it erases that radicalism, you know? Like, there's so many figures who have been co-opted by the liberal, quote unquote, left, whose radicalism has been completely erased from their uh, activist history. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lie also, and it's teaching you to forget your own past and to not look for your own role models and to not know your own history. Mm -hmm. And it's also so unimaginative and boring like, you just want everything to stay the same and, like, only change slowly? Like, ew. <laughs> You're so boring and, like, you have no creative energy. You can't think of something new. Like, this? This? You want this? Like, really? Still? Ugh. Embarrassing. <laughs> you want this? Ew, oh. this? <laughs> Disgusting. But yeah, it's just like, it just shows no imagination, you know? And if you're supposed to be in a space of creativity and, and, and building, you know, like solidarity and thought leadership and like what you're trying to do is, is, is create change, to deny yourself an opportunity to change is completely antithetical to that. You're already saying no. You're not even giving it a chance. Yeah. Totally. I mean, th this is such a great question. Uh, there's not much I can add to that except, you know, 
talking about the smoke and mirrors earlier, incrementalism is a part of that. It's part of the power play. And it is, um, there's nothing pragmatic about it, although it uses pragmatism as its weapon, right? If, as Harsha said, if, you're, if you actually want liberation for all people, if you actually want to ease the suffering um, inflicted by the system, incrementalism is not how you get there. It's, it's actually just a way to buy time and concede to the interests of those creating the suffering. It's not, um, it's not truly a pragmatic way to alleviate it. And you know, I think this is also tied to, um, you know, a sort of like false debate around like forms of action, theories of change, when people are like, well, you know, if you really want change, going on standing in a street with a sign isn't the way to do it. That's not where decisions are made. Go, you know, um, I don't know, uh, run for office or, <laughs> which. That I'm went really well, right? That. <laughs> yeah, that went super great. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I mean that's also like a false distinction, right? Of of you know that's that's part of the power play. It's like don't get on the streets; that'll never achieve anything. Look back through history; that's the only thing that's ever achieved anything. And yeah, and like you just think about the huge leaps and bounds. Like for years, abolition movements have been talking about defunding the police for years and years, holding that line, right? And being and being seen as absolutely fringe and just so unreasonable and like why would you go all the way to the extreme why would you say that why can't you why can't you just go a little bit you know and and talk about slightly defunding reforming <laughs> the police no we're yeah. just going to do some uh, equity <laughs> workshops we're going to yeah <laughs> we're going to move the budgets around they're going to have learned and they'll be good yeah EDI, yeah EDI, EDI, that's definitely and then and then now look you have a uh, defund like yeah. painted on major throughways and you have an active conversation and it, a much bigger conversation than we could ever have had, ever have had before. And so, I mean, that's one example, but yeah, I, you said everything that needed to be said on that. <laughs> Was there another question? Oh, yes. Sakshi over on the very end. <laughs> do, 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 do. Sorry, that's a bad joke. That's not creative. <laughs> Where's your creative energy? I can do better, <laughs> but not right now. Um, my question, I, and I want to preface this, that I, I work in the arts, so it very much comes from that perspective, but I think it can be applied anywhere else. I find that when it comes to leadership within the arts, it's always as if there's only two forms of leadership. You're either the artistic leader, or you are the executive leader, you're the business person, and I find that there is a huge, I think, I think it's a really problematic model, in part because sometimes those artistic people are not great leaders and they're amazing curators and they're being put in a position and become really hard to work with because they're just not the right person. They're, they have the artistic vision, but maybe not HR or whatever else. Um, but also that leadership can come from so many different places. And one of the people, like some of the people that I've admired most, um, like growing up, my mother worked in a, dance company and dance school, and one of the leaders in that organization was the cleaning lady. Literally, the cleaning lady. She was the mother to half of the students in the school. She had the initiative to start a daycare. Um, and in the organizations where I've worked, I've, I've often seen that as well, that we just kind of like pin it on these two roles, whereas I. I believe that a bookkeeper can be a leader. I believe that you know the person in the box office can be a leader. Um, people who have more technical roles, and I, I think that we within the arts like need to break open um, that idea of what leadership is and look for it in a more natural way, like the leadership that comes out of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I could talk about this forever. Um, <laughs> I feel very invested in it. 
Um, we were literally talking about this backstage, about what it's, what it's like to lead from the back and to allow everyone in the collective to shine because truly none of it could happen without everyone's work. You know, a charismatic leader is no good if they have no followers, you know, like, <laughs> you know, or if they're like a shitty leader <laughs> who ruins everyone's life, you know, like, the idea of this like charismatic leader, it's like the, you know, I feel like it's like our Western narrative like stories going back to like, you know, like the Iliad and fucking Homer, you know, writing about these dudes on these boats. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> whatever, I'm glad you crashed into a rock. Like, <laughs> that idea of the hero's journey, we've, like, especially in the West, like, we internalize it so much. And so this idea of a charismatic leader is so deeply ingrained into our subconscious. Like, don't we wish more people had hit rocks? <laughs> If I could go back in time, I would deny all white people access to the ocean forever. <laughs> That's what I'm using my one pass for. You don't know how to build a boat. You just never knew how. It's all good. Um, but yeah, you know, like that, that idea of like this charismatic leader, this person to follow. I mean, we see it in politics. We see it in nonprofits and like uh, NGOs, like this idea that you have to have this one vibrant person who represents the whole organization. That's fake. It's not real. Everyone works really, really, really hard. Everyone has specific leadership skills and specific things that they are able to do, and it all serves the team. It all serves the collective. You know, one person standing in as the representative of all those things, like, first of all, it's not true, and second of all, it's crushing to be be that person. Like, you cannot carry the entire weight of representing, like, it's like being asked to be a stand-in for an entire community. It's like being a South Asian representative, whatever the hell that means. It's like representing women, whatever the hell that means. Representing queer people, whatever the hell that means. Like, we're very diverse, obviously, and the idea that one person can embody the entirety of something is just ludicrous. And the arts has a huge problem with it, not to mention the overpaying of EDs and ADs, but I won't talk too much about that. Just saying that you can check salary ranges on the CRA website to see uh, what people make in arts organizations. It's, you can access it if you wanna know, if you're curious. Anyway, that's me. You guys have any thoughts? Do we want another? Oh, we've got another question back here. I just quickly wanted to thank uh, the festival for not holding this event at Gold Corp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of venues, you know, speaking of surviving in the capitalist hellscape, I mean, there are, you know, all kinds of partnerships and conversations that have to happen, like, across and, like, through those institutions, because we are so inextricably tied financially and resource-wise to so many colonial machines. You know, it's really, really, really hard to escape. It's incredibly difficult to escape, especially in Vancouver, which is not a sustainable place to live for hardly any of us. Not having an event at Gold Corp, it's not that difficult. <laughs> it's really not that difficult. Fair enough. And the Indian Summer Festival, they need to write like a, a massive apology or something. That's super fair, thank you. I was gonna drop the mic uh, after that. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, so, uh, sorry, uh, I had originally raised my hand, don't wanna take up too much space with it, but I'm Jewish, um, and I've been a beneficiary of something called the model minority myth. Um, so it's like a, basically, and please correct me if I'm speaking out of turn in terms of my definition, but just that, 
um, my minority status is held above other people who are marginalized as an example of how they should be when in actuality, due to structural conditions, they can never be that. And it's a way to reaffirm whiteness. And so I guess I'm just wondering your folks' perspective on the model minority myth, whether it works within South Asian communities as well, and how it works, and maybe if you have personal experience of that and uh, the ways that we can fight that sort of whiteness or you know, white supremacy together. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to maybe backtrack for a second. I really appreciate all these questions. Um, on the question of uh, leaders, um, the one thing that I wanted to add to what was already said so brilliantly was also like the fact that we need to move from distinguishing leaders and leadership, right? Like the idea of there being leaders versus the fact that leadership is a quality that we all have because part of that hero journey means that not only do we particularize one person, but it becomes this kind of like innate thing <laughs> that some people just have rather than leadership as a skill that we can all learn, right? Because then we don't actually support the idea of group leadership, the fact that we all have skills that we all have and that we can all learn. So I think it also really demobilizes us by not realizing that these are very concrete things that we can all get better at and contribute to in the various spaces that we're in, right? And so I think that's really important because otherwise the idea of skill sharing um, just becomes moot because people are just seen as somehow natural quote unquote leaders rather than the idea that we cultivate different forms of leadership proactively and intentionally. Um, and the fact that of course all kinds of leadership is valuable, right? It also means that we have to recognize that all kinds of work is valuable. And like that example you gave is so beautiful because I think it is absolutely true that the people who are least likely to be viewed as quote unquote natural leaders are the ones who are doing the most important work of actually building community and building up leadership. Um, and so I think that also helps us move away from, from these models. And I appreciate the comment about Gold Corp because I do think while we're all implicated in capitalism, there are certain lines that we should all hold, um, particularly as a social justice community broadly there are some things we just should and shouldn't do. <laughs> and there are some lines that we shouldn't cross or if we are thinking of crossing them, we need to be engaged in some kind of accountability about whom that will impact. Um, and so I appreciate that because I think sometimes the fact that we're all in a messed up system means that we can then just not ever talk about the fact that there are some things that we shouldn't do. Um, and model minority, yeah, I'm somewhat running out of water, lots of thoughts. Um, yeah, thank you for that, because I think absolutely South Asians, um, I'll speak generally here, but then come back to why this is a problem too, absolutely have been mobilized and conscripted against black and indigenous peoples in the context of you know, the US and Canada, for example, um, against poor people, against people who are otherwise marginalized, and specifically through this experience of like, you know, oh, as immigrants, you know, we have worked hard, or slash you have worked hard, and have made it. So the assumption being that therefore, indigenous peoples who are facing a vastly different experience of genocidal colonialism and deliberate impoverishment should be able to make it, right, for example. And so I think absolutely the model minority kind of myth gets conscripted in ways that have to do completely with capitalism. But also I think there's a layer to the South Asian dimension of model minority status that has everything to do with erasing class and caste as to how people, the vast majority of people migrate, right? So the ability to conscript certain South Asians as the model minority has to do with caste privileged and class privileged South Asians. And we need to be talking about this because the idea that you know the vast majority of South Asians have had a quote unquote rough immigration experience ignores the fact that the experiences of a immigrant are very different than for example, a Dalit refugee who's coming from the South Asian subcontinent, right? So when people are talking about the South Asian migrant experience, generally the model minority is generally people who come with particular class and caste privileges with the ability to migrate under certain circumstances that are already privileged by the state that are not precarious migrations, for example. 
Um, and so I think there's layers to the ways in which model minority in the South Asian context is not only used against black and indigenous communities, as many model minorities often are, and I think there's a particular way in which it's also used against marginalized South Asians as well, who are caste oppressed in particular, uh, to deny their struggles um, in the context of migration. And so I think um, that's why the idea of model minority falls short, because again, going back to the other conversation, it completely erases power dynamics that we have to be attentive to and relies on these tropes of you know, hard working and struggle um, that just are not universally true for communities based on their experiences of anti-black and anti-indigenous genocide and of you know, caste annihilation, which is one of the most violent systems on the planet, and caste, which is one of the most violent systems on the planet, which needs to be annihilated. So well said, as always, Harsha. That's why some people are refugees, some people are immigrants, and some people are expats. Diplomats. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the diplomats, of course. But, you know, I think in the South Asian context, like that um, weaponization of the model minority as, um, like, as applied to, you know, as weaponized against indigenous folks, black folks, and poor South Asians is a sort of like red carpet in deeper into white supremacy for so many so for so many of our communities as well because we are we're used as a weapon and and asked to pick sides and uh, it's just a really um, I've seen so many people in my community um, like align with that and that's a really sort of painful thing to watch and uh, where you you know, some, like family, friends, or whatever, just starting to spout a lot of like white supremacist rhetoric around indigenous people, around like our relationship to these lands, and um, yeah, so it's particularly dangerous, I think, in our in 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 our context. And so, yeah, I really grateful that you brought that up, and grateful for your analysis on that, Harsha. Um, any other hands? I think we have time for one more. Okay, right there. Sakshi, you see? Hi, Megan. Hi. Uh, no. And, um, you know, if you've had the opportunity to work within big institutions um, and be a leader, you've probably been hurt. That's just, this is something that all three of you have affirmed with things that you said tonight. And if you arrive in a position where you're at the top and you can even, like, you have this dream scenario where you can, um, you can build your own team and you often, you bring your friends in and you bring people who wouldn't normally be able to access those roles. You know, there's many, many versions of this. Um, and what we've seen as of late is that there's a lot of lateral violence. There's just trauma that comes up. And I'm wondering, in your experiences, what have you learned about how to take care of yourself in those situations and how to take care of everyone else as this dynamic is unfolding? Yeah, I mean, hi, Megan. <laughs> um, yes. So trauma-informed leadership is something that I think about a lot. Um, the last kind of community that I was sort of accountable to and um, part of and not, anyway, it's complex. Um, but I do, I, I've worked in queer community for a long time um, in a lot of different places. And queer community, queer people have experienced a lot of trauma over uh, their histories. And, you know, different generations connect with trauma in different ways, you know, like, I mean, 
Gen Z is like already there with all of the, like the therapy speak. They know everything. They're ready. They're already in therapy. We love to see it. You know, millennials were like, and Gen X, we like understand a little bit more. You know, boomers, you were raised by the greatest generation, which yikes. <laughs> um, you know, so like emotional intelligence and our understandings of ourselves and our understandings of mental health you know, uh, they change over time. And especially when we're working intergenerationally, there's a lot of um, mistranslation and not understanding. And um, also like across difference, um, you know, within a community that has like a sh sense of connection around a specific identity marker, that still doesn't mean, like we were talking about with South Asians, that there's not a lot of histories of trauma. And so trauma-informed organizing is something that like I don't think we have a time, or trauma-informed leadership either. Like we don't have a lot of resources out there. It's something that we kind of like learn in public and learn through experience by trying to just be compassionate and empathetic and relating to people. Um, and, you know, I mean, lateral violence is like some of the most painful violence that you can ever experience. Nothing hurts more than when your own people hurt you. Nothing is more shocking than that, to feel your humanity denied by people you thought saw your humanity, told you they saw your humanity. Um, and they're hurting too, you know? Like everyone has had, an, you know, like there's no person that hasn't had some kind of traumatic injury to their heart. Like that's just what happens as a human being. Um, and we don't know how to really work across that trauma, I don't think, especially when we, you know, have, especially when it's like you're working across power imbalances, you know, so like if I'm working with cis men or I'm working with straight people or working with white people, you know, there's a lot of compassion stretching that like folks of color, women, marginalized people already have to do in order to like bridge those kinds of gaps um, between being oppressed and privileged. Um, and so there's a lot of emotional labor that goes into that when you're trying to take care of everyone around you. Um, and taking care of oneself, I think, especially if you were socialized as feminine, uh, not a priority. Um, culturally and like a really difficult skill to learn and the antithesis of capitalism. Capitalism doesn't want you to care about yourself, it just wants you to work. Um, and it wants everyone around you to work and it wants you to not see your, your colleagues as human. Um, and, you know, working against that is really difficult. I'm still trying to learn how to do it uh, and yeah, I mean, it's really hard. And you also like can't protect everyone else either, you know? Like that's something that I would say to like women or marginalized people in leadership is like you can't, there's only so much you can do. So do what you are empowered to do and don't take on more than you need to. I'm talking to myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's heavy, it's hard, right? I mean, we live in the same neighborhood. We're constantly running into each other and just sighing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, trauma-informed leadership is incredibly difficult to do, and we're all so traumatized, and the pandemic was so traumatizing. And like, people are weird and squirrely right now, and tensions are high, and culture wars are on, you know? So being, like understanding our own trauma and connecting with that is really important if we're gonna stay grounded in where we're coming from because we cannot be in service of others if we're falling apart. Um, and we need to like really learn how to stretch our compassion and our empathy because like there's no other way forward. I don't even really know if I answered that very well at all, but. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that was beautifully said, Nushka. And um, yeah, just really honoring like the experiences that you have woven into this. You've really brought like such a humanity to it that I think is really inspiring for me. And I think that's what I, that's how I think about this question too. It's like we, I guess going back to you know the mentors, the the activist mentors that I was, I was lucky to be around when I was younger, and that was a different kind of organizing. That was a different kind of activism, right? It was a more old school um, thing that was about really emphasizing the collective, which achieved beautiful, tremendous things, and often the individual was lost within that. And so actually a lot of my active mentors, as much as I just admire them so much and they've, and they've re deeply informed who I am, they are um, very traumatized and burnt out people who have sacrificed way too much of their lives, um, way too many precious parts of their lives. And I feel like we get to learn from that and you know strive to emulate that um, that emphasis on collectivism and hold that dear and close and precious as we live in a culture uh, that, where capitalism seeks to atomize us and individualize us and pull us apart. We hold on to that collectivism. And as you said, we stretch to also include like a deep respect and love for ourselves, to, that honoring of ourselves and understanding ourselves as a as a fragment of that collective. And so therefore having the same compassion for yourself that you, that you have for everyone that you keep around you in your community and everyone that you're fighting for. You know, you know spending your life fighting for and organizing for, um, for people, um, you, you have to have that same respect and honoring for yourself, which is really hard to do. I think it's, it's just, it's a, a learned skill and it's, it doesn't look like, you know, capitalist self-care. It doesn't look like, it, it doesn't even look like cutting yourself off from community so that you can take care of yourself. It's often not a binary in that sense. It's, it is, they're deeply infused into each other. Like you honor yourself by honoring the people around you. And um, uh, the trauma-informed part is huge because trauma is, in an inherent part of colonialism is intergenerational, it's cellular, it's in us and it informs so many of our actions um, on so many levels. And I love that we have an expanded conversation about that now. Um, I just think that, you know, it's, it, it's necessary to, to talk about that and to, to talk about our healing, to talk about our trauma, to talk about um, how we honor ourselves um, in a way that propels and infuses and enriches our work for liberation for all. Thank you both. Thank you for that question and comment. Um, it's so hard. <laughs> um, I'd say for me, in the context of like most of my organizing is outside of um, that I consider dear to me is outside of my work context. So that changes what that question might mean because of course workplaces are mediated by different kinds of relationships and structures um, and containers um, and kind of, you know, the dynamics that it imposes on us to some degree. But I would just echo that I think truly, whenever I think of burnout, um, I think everyone that I know and my own experiences around burnout had everything to do with our relations with each other and not like the intensity of the work. You know, like burnout, from everything I observed, is not about having to stay up late a couple nights. <laughs> it's not that. That's tiredness, of course. That's not anything we should all be doing, but that deep sense of burnout and hurt and betrayal has everything to do with how we relate to one another. And so I think. Um, just even acknowledging that, that those, the things that often get privatized as like interpersonal dynamics actually are central to how we do this work because it completely informs if and how we're able to show up for it, right? Like it can't just be 
a side thing that a few people try to resolve with our really crappy accountability skills or conflict resolution skills. Sorry, I don't mean our crappy. I'm sure people have wonderful skills. But like, again, we're not taught that, right? That's not actually central to the kinds of skill sharing in leadership and all kinds of leadership that we are trained to do. We're trained to do very particular things, but we're not trained in what are often really in an anti-feminist way considered quote unquote soft skills, right? Like I find that so um, offensive that how we relate to each other is considered a side thing <laughs> rather than central to how we do this. Um, and I think, I just wanna name that because I think all of the ways in which we experience the impacts of that is because of a structural inability to contend with it, right? It's not our own personal inability. It's the fact that that is how we are showing up with each other and to one another because we don't have those skills, again, not individually, but in the broader kind of sense. Um, and I think it's also deeply contextual. It depends who, um, you know, whose edges are rubbing up against whose other edges and absolutely hurt people hurt and sometimes abusive people are abusive. And discerning that is not always clear and that is even more important why we have community so we can try to figure that out together. Um, not to create intense binaries, but you know, they might require different responses. They might require different ways of being. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is if anything, again, this just means so much more that we need each other because a lot of times the only way to move through this is not two people. It requires a lot more people to hold people who are going through these kinds of dynamics or conflicts or patterns of abuse, right? Like this is not for two people to resolve. We all have to carry it. And I think a lot about, you know, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, black feminist abolitionist, when she's talking about abolition, she says abolition is presence. Abolition is presence. And I think about, you know, we're talking about interdependence, we're talking about being in community, we're talking about organizing and how we do collective care. It fundamentally requires us to be present, not in a way where we are sacrificial lambs for a bigger cause, but where we are present with one another and able to bring those hurts to the table, which requires so much courage but also then figuring out what skills we need to be able to handle it because there is really no other way, right? There is like literally no other way other than through um, and there is no other way other than practicing it with each other, which comes with so much heartache. But then the flip side of that is then we become, you know, if we're not trying to do it with one another, we're trying to do it alone, which is even more isolating and heartbreaking in some ways. Um, and so, of course, we need rest. Of course, sometimes we never want to see another human being. And we deserve that space and we deserve that expansive um, ability to retreat. And also, we need to be able to come back and to be held and to have people walk with us um, because we just, we can't, we can't hold it alone and we weren't meant to. Um, and I think, for me, I would just emphasize that we weren't meant to. I think we feel like we were meant to do this alone but we're really not. Um, and any time that we're feeling that burnout, I hope we can just remember that we shouldn't be holding it alone and we weren't meant to hold it alone. I think, oh, one more.
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we talk about homogenizing. Yeah. So Thank you. That. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, and just echoing, we should not be celebrating Canada Day. And immigrants in particular should refuse the conscription into Canada Day. Um, you know, refuse what it is meant to be. This idea that Canada is a haven, is a safe place. All of these things that immigrants are taught, um, both as a product of white supremacy and as a product of our own, and I want to emphasize this, our own lineages of oppression. This is not only about white supremacy. We have our own lineages of oppression that this plays into, depending on who immigrants are. Um, I think we have to refuse that and first and foremost, um, you know, literally pledge our alliances and our responsibilities and our solidarities to indigenous peoples. Land back is not a metaphor. It is not a slogan. It is a political principle and an ethical principle that we have to stand with and everything that it means, right, in terms of aligning with indigenous struggles and to not believe that Canada is a good place because the violence that it commits is horrendous. And it's not about good for some and bad for others. It is a genocidal project. Um, and so absolutely, and everything that you said about the homogenizations and refusing those kinds of ways and, and also the ways in which community can mean nothing sometimes, right? Commun it's, a, it's an empty word. It's a vague word. It's an it's a romantic word, correct. Um, yeah, it has to mean something specific or it means nothing at all. Yeah, it's community is actions, it's relationships. It's not just a buzzword. You know, it has to really mean something. Yeah, I don't know if there's much to add to that. You know, uh, when we came to Canada, and we were a young family, and my dad and my sister both have a July 1st birthday. <laughs> so like double birthday in the family. And um, uh, you know, really, really interesting journey for all of us to go through, like coming here, having sort of quote unquote achieved this idea, like, you know, of the, 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 the myth the model minority myth really at its inception is like when you land here. And um, and like, it was a really interesting family journey for us to, to come here and be like, oh my God, we have the same birthday as Canada. And then deck ourselves out in the red and white flag. And now here we are like, you know, <laughs> marching for anti-Canada Day. It's just an interesting, um, it's a it's a beautiful journey that I'm really grateful I could have gone on with my family. And, um, and yeah, I totally agree with what you said. It is infuriating. It's infuriating that that, that, that is, is part of the conscription, is this wonderful, colorful celebration um, where it's like almost like an induction ceremony in some ways. And so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, even the idea of it being a country, right? Like, it, yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing. I, I find we, in Canadian media, in the, in the media landscape here, we, we have a very, very stunted idea of internationalism. It's, all, it's absent from our media landscape here. It's something that we don't want to talk about. And, and that is very much a hallmark of the Canadian colonial project that, you know, we have Canadian values. One of those Canadian values is that we fix our own backyard first. <laughs> Ever. Sorry? Peacekeeping. Peacekeeping, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we're a peaceful force um, around the world. And, you know, that is unfortunately such a tightly um, protected uh, rhetoric, such a protected narrative. Yeah, and and uh, we are robbed of that as people who live on these lands of of the understanding of our complicitness, uh, our sorry, our complicity, and our and our interdependence and interconnectedness with other people and and other places. 
in the world. And so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a real loss for all of us. It's something that is absolutely um, something that generates so much violence, especially at a time like this, where we have these intersecting crises, where we have, um, you, know, you know, just from the work that I do, a warming planet, where a rapidly warming planet, where right now in India you have 450 million people um, whose lives are at risk from extreme heat. And then you have people here who have family in Pakistan where a third of the country was underwater uh, a few months ago and still continue, thousands and thousands of people displaced. And uh, you know, these, these things that are happening as sort of distant, far away, disconnected events are, um, it's, it's deeply violent to think of them as such and to be told that they are, that they are such. We, we are absolutely interconnected. This place, this colonial project is absolutely complicit in um, these millions of deaths happening all around the world. Well, on that really uplifting note, <laughs> I am waiting for the asteroid. Um, <laughs> Um, I just want to thank Harsha and Anjali. Which one is which, right? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anjali. <laughs> I just want to thank you both so much for this conversation. I am so lucky to get to sit here with both of you. Um, thank you all so much for your incredible attention and your amazing questions. Um, and uh, yeah, that I mean, I really can't say anything more than that. Um, tomorrow, if you are still keen on coming to Granville Island, we're gonna have some amazing musicians playing in front of the Granville Island market um, all day long from about, well, all afternoon, noon to five. Um, so if you feel like coming on down and enjoying some music, please do. And that's all I'll say for now. Thank you so much for staying with us. We really appreciate it. <laughs>